Thank you, Calvin. Hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy. I am an alcoholic. Grateful to be alive and sober and uh, welcome everyone for being here today. Uh, it's customary where I come from to let you know that uh, I have a home group. It's called the Design for Living Group in Neptune, New Jersey. I, uh, I have a sponsor. I have a service sponsor. Uh, apparently, I need a lot of adult supervision. Uh, I sponsor a lot of guys and uh, most importantly, uh, I've been sober since my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was on March 28th, 1987. Uh, so very grateful for this way of life. Very grateful for a lot of the people that are on this on this meeting today. They're good friends and uh, people I've known through years and ex -spon old sponsors and just, just really excited to be here today. And uh, just so you know, for those who are not from the Jersey Shore, where I come from, where the Jersey Shore is, we're about 60 miles south of... Uh, New York City on the ocean, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the locals like to call it the Irish Riviera, but uh, members of AA like to call it cirrhosis by the sea. Uh, there's a lot of drinking here and, uh, you know, it's just a great place to grow up. And uh, Ali, thank you and your, you know, your hardworking committee for the invitation to be uh, included in this group. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, close to 35 years of sobriety next month and uh, uh, I think I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was insecure at, on some things. And one of the things I was insecure was when I saw that flyer and the people I was speaking with today, and I'm like, oh my God, he must have made a mistake. Uh, but, uh, you know, we got Ralph, well, my boy Ralph, he's, you know, we all know Ralph, you know, and we got the uh, elder stateswoman of AA, Polly, and we have uh, the voice of Fats, Teresa. And I never, I never heard John before. And then, uh, Last week, I jumped on Calvin's meeting. It's the first time I heard John, 50 years sober, giving a talk on a doctor's opinion. And I got to tell you something. I live right by Silkboard's grave. We're, I mean, I've been to more prayer vigils, more speaker meetings at Silkboard's grave than probably anyone. And uh, I got to tell you, the talk that John did last week on the doctor's opinion knocked it out of the park. So it was really great to hear him and uh, and to, uh, you know, just to be, just to be here today. So... Just grateful. So let me stop my clock. That's always a good thing. Um, so I find myself in a railroad room apartment on the Jersey side of the Hudson River, overlooking New York City, and I'm getting the test, the spiritual test. Maybe some of you guys have gotten this spiritual test. It's usually done by someone who's armed with the facts about themselves and carries a message of depth and weight. And uh, this gentleman is asking me a few questions. First question he asked me was, how long can you hold your breath? How long can you be in a 12-step program and not work the 12 steps? What makes you alcoholic? Uh, the best I could stammer out of my mouth in that moment was, I drink too much. What does your relationship with God look like? Well, I believe in God, but what does God have to do with any of this? Then he asked me a question that most of you might not believe, but this is the way it was in New Jersey, or really my neighborhood in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. He looked at me and said, well, where's your big book? And I looked at him and I said, what's a big book? Now, I'm sure there was a big book on a podium or a literature table and meetings all over the place, but it wasn't something that we were encouraged to open up. It wasn't something we talked about like we do today. I mean, it wasn't until Joe and Charlie came blowing through the Northeast that people started to really read that book again. But I didn't know what a big book was. And then he asked me a consideration or a question, but it was really a consideration. He wasn't looking for an answer. He was really just throwing this out at me. He said, Jimmy, if AA works, why do you have so many problems? Now, I'm not embarrassed by some of those answers. I'm probably more embarrassed to let you know that I was five years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous that time, an active member of a home group dying from something I didn't know I was dying from or something I'd even understand because we never talked about this stuff back then. I was dying of this thing called untreated alcoholism. And I really truly didn't understand the delusion I was living in because I really believed that the spiritual malady, even though I couldn't put words to what that was, I really believed at that time that abstinence was the solution to my spiritual malady. I thought just not drinking, I was gonna be okay. And I found that a lot of people feel that way. I truly believe that alcoholism came in a bottle till I heard my old sponsors say, you know, uh, alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle. 
it comes into my mind and my mind will create all these delusions and all these distortions about my life and everything that's going on. And another thing that happened in that period of time was I became painfully aware of what the old timers were saying back then. Because what they used to say was that alcoholism is a soul sickness caused by a separation from God and a disconnect from each other. Now, I don't know if that's delusional thinking or that's a delusional statement. I just know that there was a long wedge or a big wedge between me and God, and there was a big wedge between me and you. So here I am five years without a drink in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, an active home group member, making coffee, setting up, breaking down, putting out literature, doing all the things that we do in our home groups, but I'm dying and I don't know I'm dying and I have no relationship with God. And I got a wedge probably between me and every person I ever met. And the worst, best way I could describe myself was I was lost, I was sick, and I was stock raving sober. But that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is that my ego doesn't want to let you know any of that stuff. Right? My ego wants me sick and separated. And as my old sponsor who's on here now said it all the time, and I hear him say it all the time, is that my ego wants me dead but will settle for me drunk. And that's where I was at five years of sobriety in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I always like to say that I was born perfect and I was quickly handed over to these two character defects called mom and dad. And I joke about that and I say that all the time just to have some fun with it. But the truth of the matter is, you know, I've always been one to blame everyone for the way I feel. Again, that's another delusion that nothing's my fault. And I grew up that way with these parents because all these parents ever did for me or tried to do or try to give me was morals, values, education. And for whatever reason, I took everything of goodness, I rolled it into a ball and I stuffed right down my parents' throat. Now, you know, that, that pattern or that theme goes along my life for a long period of time that, you know what, it's always something out there that makes me feel the way I do in here. You know, and I'm growing up and I'll be 64 in a, a couple of days. I'm, I'm growing up in, in a city in North Jersey. Uh, I'm growing up in a, a very blue collar neighborhood. I'm growing up where everyone's a cop, everyone's a fireman, everyone's a union worker. It doesn't seem like much education going on. Matter of fact, if I was standing on a corner and you drove by and said, hey, Jimmy, there's a dead bird, I would look up. That's the kind of guy I was. I wasn't too bright, but I was a street guy. And I really wanted to be, you know, my real goal in life was to be a wannabe wise guy, you know, and, and I wanted the older guy's approval, you know, and, you know, very quickly, you know, the, the people that I should have been looking up, I didn't really care about. All of a sudden, the people that were my idols in the neighborhood were the bookie, the bartenders, the older guys, the guys that would run in the streets. And I wanted to be just like that. You know, little do I know, little do I know, 20 years earlier than the day that my parents or the day I was born, my parents carried me over that threshold into my house. Little did I know exactly 20 years earlier, exactly seven miles west of my front door in a city called Newark, New Jersey in a building at 17 William Street, on the sixth floor of that building, in an office called Honors Dealers, there was two gentlemen, and they were writing this book, this book called Alcoholics Anonymous. One man was Bill W, and the other one was Hank P. And little did I know, and little did my parents know, as much as they tried to give me morals, values, a way of life, a design for living, it wasn't until their child, their last child, read that book and applied this book to their life, that their child got everything that these parents try to teach them through many years. So here I am, you know, I'm growing up and we hear this term all the time, that disease of perception, the way I see alcohol, I equate alcohol with fun, I equate alcohol with problem solved, I equate alcohol with freedom, you know. Uh, growing up in a neighborhood where the only requirement for membership was five or more kids. There's always a party for something. There's a birthday, there's a christening, there's a graduation, there's something. Somebody's going off to the war. I mean, there's always something going on. And the thing that's always involved at all these events is king alcohol. And what I would witness as a young kid is the ease and comfort that would come at once by taking that first drink because I would watch my dad, my uncles, the neighbors, the older guys, the women, you know, they would have fun. And again, my mind is being molded for this idea that drink is a good thing and I can't wait to do it again. You know, I got this that called this guy, dad. My dad's a guy that I'm afraid of. My dad's a guy that I, I really have a lot of fear of because my dad's just one of those old school generational Korean war vet, don't show your emotions, don't talk about how you feel, push down everything type of guy. And the way he deals with problems is he drinks at it. 
you know, and he creates a lot of fear and he creates a lot of worry. He creates a lot of insecurity in the household. But what I would witness as an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old is that every day at five o'clock, my dad would come home. He was a butcher, all right? And he would come home and he, my mom would make these two pictures, one martinis and the other one Manhattan's. And what happened was my dad would take that first drink and all of a sudden, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he became a different person. You know, all of a sudden he wanted to be the guy to have a catch in the backyard. He'd be a guy with a, you know, a sense of humor. He'd just be different. But don't let me fool you because there were those days. And those are the days that I like to push inside and not talk about. And maybe they happen to some of you. It's those days when my dad would just go off the rails and my dad would just blow up and my dad would just be angry. And all of a sudden the plates are flying across the kitchen. The kitchen chair would be flying across the kitchen. One of us young kids would be flying across the kitchen. And again, you know, that doesn't make me alcoholic, but what that makes me feel or make me is very insecure and riddled with fear because I was so afraid of my father and I would just push those emotions in and we're not gonna talk about those emotions. And I live, in a, I live in a house where things don't leave that house, right? So it's not like I go to Ali and say, Ali, this is what's going on. My dad's a nut. No, I just internalize everything. And I start to do something that a lot of us do over a long period of time is I start to hold secrets. And my secrets are just that I can't talk about what's going on in my house. I put the good game face on. Everything is wonderful. Meanwhile, I'm insecure. I'm riddled with fear. I've got all these character defects. I don't know how to talk about that stuff. Matter of fact, when I land in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm under another delusion that if I just don't drink, all these things I feel internally will be magically disappear and I'll be good to go. What a lie I told myself for many years. And 51 years ago, I found myself 51, half a century ago. Oh my God, am I getting old? 51 years ago, I find myself in a cemetery with five guys that I could just, that I could remember their full names to this day. And here comes that first bottle. It's cold 45 malt liquor. And I grab that bottle and I start drinking on that cold 45. Here comes that second bottle. It's Mohawk blackberry brandy. And I start drinking on that blackberry brandy. Now you hear this term all the time. I think every person that's on this call right now has probably said this term, but we live life forward. We understand it backwards. I look back 51 years, understanding what I suffer from today. I could tell you with assurance that I'm alcoholic right out of the gate. Because not that I became an everyday drinker, but one of the first things that happened to me was that the first leg of this three-legged stool got set in place, this physical allergy, this phenomenon called craving. I couldn't stop once I started on day one. I puked purple for two weeks. I took a beating from my father. My mother grounded me for life. I'm 13 years old. I found the magic elixir, King Alcohol. For some reason, everything seemed okay. Now you might say to yourself, and I'm sure some of you have, some of you don't, but at 13 years old, what could be wrong? Everything in my eyes, everything in my mind. You know, this fear, this anger, these insecurities, all these character defects that I eat my lunch that I don't even know how to put a word to them. I just feel different. But King Alcohol on that day worked. It quieted my mind. It quieted my insides. It just quieted everything that was going on. And so that second piece of this three-legged stool got set in place, the obsession, the idea that's so strong, it overcomes all of their ideas. I can't wait till next week. I can't wait till I'm with those guys again at the football game. I can't wait till I'm at that dance and we can recreate what just happened two weeks ago. You know? And then that third piece of this three-legged stool, the spiritual malady deep down within me. I don't know those that are words back then. I just know I'm different. Now, little do I know, later on, many years later, when I'm sitting with my old friends in the neighborhood, we all feel that same way. We all grow up the dad, the dad and the mom that seems to be exactly the same. You know, we all have violence and, well, I shouldn't say all, but we all have things going on in our home that we're not allowed to talk about. It never leaves your house, never leaves the neighborhood. But that's another story. So here I am, I take that first drink and I step on this path that's really going downhill quickly. And over the next 16 years of my life, you know, I come to that place where our literature really puts three important words to it of pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. You know, and I'm the guy that's always trying something to make myself feel better. I'm the, I'm the double-edged sword guy, I like to call it, because one side of me is always blaming you and everything else out there for the way I feel in here. But there's the other half of me that's always seeking something out there to make myself feel better, like money, like drinking, like drugs, like girls, like cars, you name it. Something of material, something of materialistic thing to make me feel better inside. And what happens is, you know, I'm about 24 years old, 25 years old. You know, everyone's growing up in my neighborhood, it seems like, but me. 
you know, and I see guys getting jobs. I see guys finishing college. I see guys, you know, getting into relationships, starting marriages and doing all this thing. Now, I always like to say that somewhere along the line, God cracked my skull open and he put this chalkboard in my head. And on his chalkboard was these three emotions of shame, remorse and guilt, of guilt and remorse. And it just seemed like up to the age of 25 years old, I was checking off one of those emotions. The shame of being a bad son, the shame of living on the streets and starting to act out and do all the things, the shame of being locked up so many times when I'm 25, the shame of quitting college, the shame of breaking up relationship, on and on and on it goes. You know, the guilt of the things I was doing, the remorse of hurting my family, all this stuff was building up in my head. And I just thought that if I just take a drink, that'll all go away. Again, another delusion. I think when I land in Alcoholics Anonymous, all the shame, guilt, and remorse I have is just going to magically disappear like some tooth fairy is going to come down and wave a magic wand over my head. But thank God for the 12 steps of alcoholics and this treasure map that we're talking about because that's the thing that got me right. So here I am. I wind up, uh, you know, uh, I meet a girl in a bar and this is the way I do relationships. I say to my sister, introduce me to this girl and, uh, you know, uh, I'll buy an illegal substance. She does. And four months later, I'm married. And that's how I do relationships. And, and I'm married because, you know, I think this is the answer to my problems. Now, I don't know I'm alcoholic at this point. I just know I'm screwed up in the head and I have a lot of problems. I don't even know what kind of words to use for that stuff. I just know and I think that if I just get married, I'm going to be OK. And four months into this marriage, I walk out of this marriage because by the time when I was 18, by the time I was 18 years old, I was an everyday drinker. I'm 25 now. My life is quickly going into the ground. But I think that this is the solution to my problems. But I walk out of this marriage after four months because I'm irresponsible. I'm not caring. I don't like her. I don't like me, really. Uh, you know, I don't know how to be a man. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to really be a father or, or not that I'm a father yet. I just don't know how to how to deal with this with this thing. And uh, what I do is I take off for a place called Boca Raton, Florida, where I had a friend who lived on the ocean, big house, million dollar house. You know, I'm in this apartment looking out the glass windows, see the ocean, see the bikini, see the beach. It seems like everything a man would want is right there. But see, I'm stuck in this apartment. And I'm getting that knock at the door like we all do with the four horsemen of terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontent. I'm riddled with shame and guilt and remorse of walking out of this marriage, of not talking to anyone. But see, I have a solution. I still think it's a solution. It's called Johnny Walker Red. You see, I pick up that bottle of Johnny Walker Red and all I need to do is crack the seal because I'm at my drinking. I'm at this point in my drinking where I don't even need to take that first sip yet. I just need to crack that seal because when I do, I can feel that sense of grandiosity come back. But when I take that first drink, all of a sudden that perfect little kid comes out and that perfect little kid has a, a list from here to Toronto, the things and the people that it's their fault to the way I feel. And what eventually happens is I come back to New Jersey. And see, I'm so riddled with shame and guilt of what I've been doing to my family and to this woman and to a lot of people in my life. I make a decision to live on the streets. And I live on the streets for about 18, 19 months of my life, the next 18, 19 months of my life. And see, I put my head down wherever I could put my head down. Whether it's in someone's apartment, somebody's car, out on a couch that's being thrown out, to wherever it is, right? And it's amazing what happens to you when you're on the streets. You're emotionally shut down. You're spiritually shut down. You become shallow. You become a person that you never expected to be. See, I'm that guy, like many of us, I have all these goals, these dreams, these aspirations. I want to be somebody. But see, what I don't understand at this point is that I take that for a strength. And see, I, I, can't, I can't comprehend this thing that you tell me when I walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that the first strength gets you loaded. There's no way in hell that the first drink gets me drunk. It's those last 20 drinks and those outside issues is the problem. I can't see that I'm getting drunk on that first drink. But here I am, I'm living on the streets, I'm doing what I'm doing. And I walk in a bar one day and these guys in the bar said, Jimmy, you need to go to Newark Airport. They're hiring guys like you. Finally, being seen for my potential. So I go out to Newark Airport the next day with two other guys. We're all in AA today. We rob a car. You should have seen that amends when we had to go back to this guy and make amends on the car we stole. That's a story for a night step uh, down the road. But here we are. I'm in, a, I'm, in, I'm in Newark Airport this next day. And I couldn't put the words to how I felt until I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't, put, I couldn't tell you in a general way what I felt like, how I, how I thought. I, 
I was dying of this thing called alcoholism and I didn't know it. It took me a long time in the rooms of AA to really understand my predicament on that day in the airport. And it wasn't until I opened that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and turned for page eight and read Bill's story that he put words to my first step experience. He put words to all our bottoms when he said no words could tell of the loneliness and despair I felt in a bit of morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I met my match. I've been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And for the first time in my life, I really started to think that maybe drinking's a problem. I'm 29 years old at this point. I just turned 29 years old. And as I sat in this chair and I was waiting for this guy to call me to give me an interview for this job at the airport. And the job at the airport, there used to be a company called People's Express that became United or Continental, then United. And the job was basically to take the luggage that was over there and put it on the plane over there. And this is where I like to always segue a little and let you know that if you flew through Newark Airport in the 80s and you're still waiting for your luggage, well, maybe I'll make amends to you later on. But that's what we had to do. But here I am, you know, I'm in this chair and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden a complete stranger sits next to me. And after a couple of minutes, the stranger looks at me and said, what's your problem? And for whatever reason, well, I know the reason today, it's called God's grace. I spit my life story up on this complete stranger in about 10 minutes. And he looks at me and says, I have the solution for you. And I said, what's that? Pulled out a piece of paper. This is pre-phone, pre-cell phone, pre-beeper days. He pulled a piece of paper out, wrote a street down on this piece of paper and said, you know where this is? And I said, yeah, that's in my old neighborhood. He put a number in front of that street and said, is it possible for you not to take a drink today? It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, I want to drink right now, to be honest with you. He goes, try not to drink today and be at this address at seven o'clock tonight. At seven o'clock that night, stone cold sober, with my knees knocking, wondering if I even met a person earlier in the day because I was so delusional. I'm standing in front of this house and I am filled with fear. What did I get myself into this time? And all of a sudden, a 1979 Chevy Impala pulled up. And the stranger was driving, and there was a bunch of other strangers in that car. And they said the most unbelievably spiritual thing you'll ever hear in AA, get in the car. And I got in the car with these men. And they drove me around a corner to my grammar school, where the Jersey City young people were meeting. It was March 28, 1987, and they walked me into my first meeting of AA. And for years, I thought it was bingo. Who knew it was AA? You know, and I remember walking down those metal chairs. I'm going to steal a line from Ralph because it really, really means something to me when I heard Ralph say this a long time ago, that walking into grace doesn't feel like walking into grace. It felt like I was walking out of chaos, and my life was totally chaotic. I couldn't understand or grasp what I was walking into on March 28, 1987. All I know is I walked down this hallway and I looked into that school cafeteria where I sat as a sixth grader, a seventh grader, an eighth grader, with all the goals, the dreams, the aspirations, you name it, that I wanted to be somebody in my life. But King Alcohol cut my legs out from underneath me. And I'm walking down this hallway and I could smell the smell of, this is for you old timers, the smell of Sanka coffee. And as I got down to the end of the hallway, I met the most important person you'll ever meet in Alcoholics Anonymous. We call him the greeter. And this gentleman stood at the door and he put his hand out to me and I grabbed that flimsy reed and he pulled me in. He told me to grab a half a cup of coffee. He told me to sit up front because I could probably hear better. But he did something for me that we're all responsible to do to any newcomer or anyone that shows up to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He gave me a piece of my dignity back that day because he didn't judge what I looked like. He didn't judge what I sounded like. He didn't care that every other word was profanity. He said, keep coming back, kid. And that started my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not here to give you a drunk along all those stories like that. But very quickly, my life got recreated. I got back with that wife. I had those two little AA kids that we like to call them. You know, I got a real job. I got my first sober car. I had money in the bank. 
And to the untrained eye, it looks like normal living is a solution to alcoholism. But then again, I'm fine, I'm dying in the rooms of AA. But you see, I got this thing called ego and pride that doesn't want to talk about that stuff. So I show up to your meetings and you say, Jimmy, how you doing? Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Got the car, got the wife, got the kids, got the job, got money. I'm good to go. I can't see the power of God working in my life at all until I look back. I'd like to share this story all the time because it was really a, a surrender moment because my story isn't a, a guy who came to AA. I got the spiritual rocket ship and just kept going up, up and away. My story has been, I have had growth, hit the wall. I've had growth. I've hit a wall. I've had more surrenders than, you know, than anyone in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I look back and I could see I had a real surrender at 18 months. I come off a night shift and I walk into my house and what do I do? I see my dad dead on the floor. Same age as me today. He's dead on the floor. I looked down the hall. I could see my mom crying her eyes out. I'm programmed at this point. What do I do? Call my sponsor. What else? I call my sponsor. He says, call 911 and let's pray. So I'm praying over my dead father's body and I'm looking at him and I'm like, he doesn't even look like my dad anymore because he dies of emphysema, but his body's filled with fluid. So it doesn't even look like my father laying on the floor. First cop shows up, starts taking down the information. All of a sudden he looks at me and says, I don't see you walking the streets anymore. I said, yeah, I don't do that anymore. He goes, matter of fact, I don't even see you in the bars drinking anymore. I said, yep, don't do that anymore either. He goes, well, how do you do that? And I told him about you. I told him about Alcoholics Anonymous. And before you know it, I'm 12-stepping this cop over my dead father's body. And why I tell you that story is because my boy Brian just celebrated 32 years of sobriety. Not that I have the power to get anyone sober or, not, or have anyone drunk. It's just that God will use us without our permission all the time. That God will always make us an instrument. And that really is the first time I experienced that I have a surrender that I need more people in my life. I need others in my life. And at five years of sobriety, here I am in that apartment. This guy, Bill Grace from St. Paul, Minnesota, same place from my, where my sponsor came from. And after he asked me those questions, he's, he's, starting to, he's starting to talk to me. He's starting to paint this picture for me, this visualization of what this is really about. He talks about two goals, the goals that I truly believe in today. First goal. The obvious one, don't pick up the first drink. But then he talks about this second goal, something I never heard about. He goes, Jimmy, you can enter the world as a spirit. That's really the goal here, to have a spiritual experience, to see life differently, to step out into the sunlight, to experience real freedom from the bondage yourself, to have real relationships, to have a relationship with God, to get those wedges out of the way. But in order for you to do that, you have to look into, you have to walk through the darkness of your life. That was the real fear. See, I just can't get there by not drinking. I need a plan of action. And it was the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at five years at my kitchen table or his kitchen table, same I do downstairs with all the guys I sponsor and anyone who I take through the work, we really dive into that first two steps. We look at this problem, we look at the solution, this disconnect from power, disconnect from each other. This threefold disease that I like to call it. Some people call it a twofold disease. But what Bill Grace did with me that day is make me really make sure he painted me into a corner where I had no choice but to take one of those two alternatives. Spiritual life, spiritual death, your choice. Thank God I was willing to pick spiritual life. We got on our knees, held the man's hands. I, at this point, I'm five years sober in AA. I've held a lot of hands in prayer circles. First time I ever got on my knees and held another man's hands. I was embarrassed by that, believe it or not. I'm a homophobe. I'm a lot of things. But I couldn't believe what was going on in the moment. He could say that prayer without the book open. I had the book open and I was reading that third step prayer. And I could feel his spirit coming to my spirit. And when I got off my knees, he gave me that time frame. Next, it's time to go into the darkness of your life and to start looking at this stuff that's really been blocking you from God. And I started to write that inventory. And I started to get down to the common manifestations of living a life on self-will. And I started to examine a lot of things in my life that, you know, these secrets, these insecurities, these fears. I started to look at all these fears. I started to look at all the harms I caused. 
I started to look at a lot of stuff I never looked at in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He told me it was the treasure map to God. And like I've heard my sponsor and when he used to run around with Sandy Beach all the time, they used to both say that all the time, that the book's not the treasure, the book is the map to the treasure. The treasure is to step out into the sunlight of the spirit and to have this experience. So I started to uncover, discover, and discard the things in my life that were blocking me. And it was very many, a lot of the times I was writing this stuff down, I felt childlike because this was the stuff that I was carrying in my life forever. I'll never forget that day I had that original fit step when I sat with Bill. I gave him my life on that day. I didn't hold on to any secrets. I had the most unbelievable experience at, after my original fit step. Went to a place called Liberty State Park. It's on a Hudson River overlooking New York City. I remember walking out on a pier. I remember opening my book. I read those first five of all, saw the stones properly in place. All of a sudden, I looked to my right. I could see the Statue of Liberty. It's a quarter mile away. I looked across the Hudson River. I could see the World Trade Center. It's right there. I looked to my left, Ellis Island, symbols of freedom. And I sat there as a 32-year-old man, free, free. I could feel the arms of God wrapped around me. And all I was really doing was following this map through the darkness of my life. And I don't have the time to tell you that, yeah, I hit a few bumps in the road for doing that. And at 10 years, I almost drank, or 13 years, I almost drank. At 10 years, you know, I was, again, emotionally shot, spiritually shot, another surrender in Alcoholics Anonymous, resistant change, resistant letting go and letting God. Why do I resist God? Why do, I, why do I at times do I resist change? Bill writes it perfectly. At some of these we balk. We thought we could find an easier sort of way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas. The result was known to we let go. Absolutely. Why can't I let go? Because of my pride. My pride is the essence of, of my self-centeredness. My pride is the justifier of all character defects. My pride leads to parade. And I can't let go and let go because my ego won't allow it. My ego doesn't want anything to do with the power greater than myself, a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I suffer in the wounds of AA. But then I meet my old sponsor, Peter, and he takes me through this process. And I start to break this down and peel the onion back a little bit deeper. And I start to look at six and seven in a way I never looked at it, six and seven, this pendulum of how most of us walk into the rooms of AA, black and gray, I can't see the middle. I mean, black and white, I can't see the grayness in my life. The pendulum of one day I like it, the next day I hate it. You know, I start to look at the things that are blocking me from God, you know. I understand that I got to get this pendulum to stop swinging so broadly. I got to stop putting my sobriety based on how people and circumstances are in my life. I got to get to that place that Bill talks about as being right size, where we could all experience the gift of emotional sobriety, where it's not people and not people and situations and circumstances that are going to make me happy. It's my relationship with God. And then I, you know, I get I get this consideration from probably one of the most important things I've ever heard before. Something that I'll throw out to everyone here. Do I look at the people and the situations and the circumstances of my life through the lens of a character defect? Or do I look at it through the eyes of God? In my whole life, I've been looking at things with fear, with anger, with envy, with jealousy, you name it. But can I start looking at the people and the situations and the circumstances of my life with love and tolerance and compassion and forgiveness? And that's what started to happen to me. And I got on this bike called life. And I had this idea that if I could just live up to these four absolutes on a daily basis, I'll have a pretty good life. I don't know where I got that from, the Oxford group, you know, of purity, unselfishness, love, and, dis and honesty. And every day is a day when I bring that into prayer. Every day is a day that I try to pedal towards that. But like most of us, I'm going to fall off that bike. The idea here is I need to get back on that bike. And whether I fall off five times, ten times, a hundred times, it's the willingness to get back on the bike. And when I do that, I, <clears throat> I have a pretty good day. I don't get about two minutes or one minute, I don't even know. I just want to talk about one thing and uh, <clears throat> being pulled to talk about. Last year, my mother died of COVID. <clears throat> and uh, January was one year. And this treasure map has brought me to a place, this sunlight of the spirit, where you're going to experience everything. Life, death. You name it, it's life. 
And I was sitting there at my kitchen. Peter gave me a call that day. You okay? It's one year anniversary of my mom passing. It was horrible becoming the parent of your parent. But what popped in my mind is all you guys, the evidence, as we call it, the evidence of getting through anything in, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll never forget being called to this assisted living where my mom was basically dead in the bed, right? Full-blown dementia, didn't know who I was, anything. <clears throat> I remember going in there, taking the test, the, the, the COVID test, putting on the PPE, and the hospice nurse said this to me. She goes, Jimmy, she can't open her eyes and she can't speak, but she could hear you. I remember just saying, hi, mom, and I saw her chest rise. And then I had that moment. The moment that you guys have had with people that have passed away. And I was able to tell my mother how much I appreciated her, how much I loved her. We had a long conversation with no reply from her. I just knew that God got us right. Two days later, I'm in my house. <clears throat> and my daughter walks in with her husband. And she hands me a scratch off, a lottery ticket. She goes, here, scratch this off. I had an extra one. I said, all right. So I'm scratching it off and conversations going on in my kitchen. My wife, Mary Beth, my kid, you know, the kids and everything. And I'm scratching off one side of this lottery ticket and uh, I hit the prize. I won a prize. And I even said to my wife, call the realtor. We're buying a condo in Florida, you know, goofing around, right? And then you had to go to this other box and the box was the prize. And I start to scratch off the box and it says, we're having a baby. We're having a baby. Who's having a baby? You're having a baby? I can't believe I'm going to be a grandfather for the first time. The moral of that story is this. God will take you when he needs you, and God will bring something to you. And my experience being on this path is that I've experienced a lot of death, and now I've experienced a lot of life. And I can't think of a better place where I've experienced life, but in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous with you guys and really living in the sunlight of the spirit. You know, that's been the treasure map. It has brought me to a place where I meet people just like me. And we get to share our experience, our strength and our hope. And the 12 and 12 Bill calls it the priceless gift. And what's that priceless gift? The spiritual experience and the sobriety that we all have today. And guess what? We could all have this, it's just a matter of being willing. And finally, you know, I always like to talk about a good old old timer named Jack C. A lot of you guys remember Jack C. from Hagerstown, Maryland, Judge Jack. And if Jack got to get to know you, you know, whenever he went to a conference, he would send you a postcard from wherever he was at. And he would tell you about where he's at, what's going on and all this stuff. But he would always write this at the bottom of that postcard. Sober sure is better. And if you're new or you're just coming back, I implore you to put one hand into God and one hand to AA and get on this path because sober sure is better. What a life. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you.